turn off my video just. Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum of Iowa. The Iowa History 101 webinars share Iowa stories and history of the state through a cultural history lens on the second and fourth Thursdays of each month. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our website at iowaculture.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend, and don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today, we will learn how Black women's practices of institutional citizenship in AME churches and the Iowa State, Iowa State bystander shaped the priorities and possibilities of Black activism in Iowa. We'll consider the historical lessons that this late 19th century activist culture might lend to ongoing struggles for racial equity. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are available by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout this webinar. My colleague Matt Beyer is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Now I'm pleased to introduce our presenter, Mila Kaut. Mila is the doctoral, doctoral student in US history and a Mellon Cluster Fellow in Gender and Sexuality Studies at Northwestern University. Her research focuses on the intersections of race, gender, and public memory in the Midwest in the late 19th century. She's particularly interested in the relationships between historic preservation, commemorative culture, and the politics of citizenship since the Civil War and Reconstruction era. Mila completed her BA in History, Music, and Gender, Women's and Sexuality Studies at the University of Iowa in 2019. As an undergraduate, she co-organized the Iowa Colored Conventions Project, a satellite project of the Colored Conventions Project that aims to recover and teach the history of 19th century Black organizing in Iowa. Prior to graduate school, she worked to merge historical inquiry, community engagement, and policy development as a research fellow with the Iowa Campus Compact and City of Des Moines Department of Civil and Human Rights. And now I'm happy to turn it over to Mila to begin the webinar. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, and thank you also to the State Historical Society of Iowa for making today possible. And I, thanks to all of you for attending. It's a privilege to be with you all this afternoon. Um, so the title of today's presentation is Printing and Performing Citizenship, Black Activist Cultures in Iowa. So under this broad topic, we'll be focusing specifically on the intersections between church building, convention organizing, and print culture in Iowa in the second half of the 19th century. So to give you all a brief roadmap of what we'll be covering today, um, we'll start by looking at the African Methodist Episcopal church building and color convention movements um, together. Um, and then we'll move on by looking at Afro-Protestant print culture and particularly the founding of the Iowa State Bystander in Des Moines. And then we'll close out by looking at the commemorative and expressive activist cultures um, really rooted in Des Moines and in St. Paul and in the bystander. Um, okay, so I'll begin today by explaining a concept that I think will be useful for framing the presentation overall. Um, so the concept of Black parallel politics comes from the Color Conventions Project and has been especially developed by one of its co-founders, literary scholar, Dr. P. Gabriel Foreman. So it's a concept that helps us to recover the history of the color conventions movement, which it was a national movement of black political organizing that began in 1830 and lasted well after the Civil War. Um, so this framing asks us to expand our sense of where a convention begins and ends, um, to ask what labor makes the convention space possible, um, to ask where the organizing begins and ends, who shapes the agenda is taken up during conventions, and finally, who takes up the calls that are delivered by delegates and um, kind of makes them real through multiple avenues after the physical convention gathering ends. Um, this framing also asks us to um, consider what would happen if we were to decenter the interracial and oftentimes predominantly white narratives of abolitionist organizing that we tend 
as educators, historians, and so on and so forth, um, to associate with abolitionists and civil rights organizing in the 19th century. Um, so here today, we are instead centering Black institution building, Black political thought, and the relationships in the circuits of development and mentorship that took shape through these processes. Um, so we'll be using this concept today as a framing for thinking about 19th century organizing, um, engaging it in the context of Iowa, where those white underground railroad and abolitionist stories have been so predominant in the classroom and in our historical and cultural preservation landscapes. So if we want to identify where Iowa's nexus of Black organizing took shape, we can begin by looking at the AME church building and convention organizing movements as connected in their missions, leaderships, and um, bases and strategies. The movements followed parallel tracks from their genesis in the 1840s with the organization of Bethel AME and Muscatine, and um, in the 50s with the convention that was then held at that church, um, and they kind of followed these tracks through the end of the century. So we'll turn now to the earliest period of AME church building in Iowa, which began, I just mentioned, in 1848 with the founding of the Bethel AME Church in Muscatine, Iowa. So a little bit of context. At this point, Black communities in Iowa were concentrated primarily in eastern river towns like Muscatine, Keokuk, and Cedar Rapids. Um, this is because of the economic prospects these primarily agricultural communities offered and because of the nature of the transportation routes available to formerly enslaved people who arrived in Iowa in the decades leading up to and following the Civil War. So formerly enslaved uh, free people uh, constituted the majority of the population of many of these communities. Um, this changed by the 1860s and the 1870s when the communities were constituted both of those who had escaped or otherwise claimed their freedom long before uh, national emancipation and those who migrated to the upper Midwest after securing their freedom amidst the Civil War and Reconstruction periods. Um, so much of Iowa's earliest race work, including the AME movement and early campaigns for school desegregation and suffrage, was initiated within these river town communities. Um, sorry, my image isn't showing here. It is a picture of the um, first of the Bethel AME church. Um, I apologize for that. Um, but now, looking directly to church building. Um, so women were central to the process of founding churches. Um, historian and author of Emancipation Diaspora, um, Dr. Leslie Schwann, has shown how reading church financial records um, reveals how women's income generating and income saving activities made every step of the process of church building, from incorporation to paying pastor salaries to securing a physical building space to supporting mutual aid in the community possible. Um, so the church building movement in Iowa gained traction through around 1889 with around 20 congregations forming across the state. And as Black Methodists assembled their congregations, they continued to adapt the denomination's pillars of economic and cultural autonomy to fit the particularities of the still fairly new and um, growing communities of newly freed people and more settled Black Iowans. Um, it's also important to remember here that this statewide church building movement was unfolding in a larger context. The AME denomination itself was born out of the exclusion of Black Methodists from white congregations and the practices of racism that Black worshipers faced in and outside of those churches was a constant backdrop um, to the institution building that took root in Iowa and elsewhere. So we can read church building in Iowa as an inherently political process that reflected Black Iowans' careful assessments of and resistance to white supremacy. Okay, our pictures are back now. Um, so if we go back just a bit now to the founding of the Muscatine AME Church in 1848, this church served as the meeting spot for the 1857 convention, but the influence of church building um, on the convention movement went far beyond providing physical meeting spaces. So I'll pause here to note that the 1857 convention was not Iowa's first convention. There was a convention held in 1853 that was likely the state's first, um, where delegates gathered to elect lawyer and activist Alexander Clark to attend a national colored convention in Rochester, New York. Um, but it's also not out of the question that other conventions predated the one held um, in 1853. Um, but we're looking at 1857 now because it's in the decades preceding and following this convention that the intersections between church building and convention organizing really took root and produced a broader network of race work across the state. So the movement's shared objectives, leaders, and strategies um, with Black Iowans organizing around 20 congregations and at least 17 political conventions um, in the same like four to five decade period um, is really significant. 
Um, so as was the case in Muscatine, um, churches provided the meeting space for convention, pastors presided as convention presidents and organizers, and delegates drew upon the rhetoric and the rituals of the church as they delivered calls for suffrage, um, full citizenship, and education rights. So we can see the imprint of the two movements upon each other already in the proceedings from the 1857 convention. Delegates chose to focus on and form committees to deliberate a few issues that included education and immigration. So it's important to contextualize delegates' decision to focus on immigration. This convention took up the issue amidst the presence of an active American colonization society um, and in some of the earliest decades of Black community and institution building in the state. So delegates' experiences as recent migrants to the state and as institution builders and their experiences as formerly enslaved people were all important to the stance they ultimately took on the issue in 1857. So as we can see in these documents on screen, um, delegates unequivocally rejected colonization schemes. Um, they drew upon the founding documents and upon re religious rhetoric to deliver arguments about being born on American soil and therefore deserving treatment as full citizens. Um, however, we also shouldn't read this as a total or a final assessment of these conditions or um, of delegates' stance on um, colonization. Um, these proceedings were published in the Provincial Freeman which was a Canadian newspaper run by Black writer, lawyer, and activist, Mary Ann Chad Carey. So the newspaper published the proceedings from this convention, along with a call to action for African Americans to migrate to Canada um, in order to claim the citizenship they sought in the US. Additionally, Bowen Bowser, who was the convention president in 1857, actually chose to join um, the American Colonization Society's um, colonization scheme leaving the U.S. for Liberia just three years after the convention, likely because um, they offered him assurances about being able to practice law over in Liberia. So we'll take a step back here now and ask, um, where are the women? So if you studied the 1857 convention through the convention proceedings and other documents alone, you would miss a crucial piece. Um, these documents impress the idea that women were absent from the formulation and the delivery of calls for education rights, for voting, and for other forms of um, equality. But if we return to the idea of a parallel politics and trace church building and convention movements as constitutive of these parallel politics in Iowa, then we can locate Black women's activism and recognize it as critical to the leadership and objectives of race work. And this kind of framing is also crucial to understanding the character of Black organizing in the state, to recognizing the respectability politics that would come to shape um, the overall um, institutions and ideologies espoused by race work in the state. So this strategy and framing of Black parallel politics changes the questions we can ask and helps us to uncover the mechanisms of change that produce those sing singular narratives like um, the achievement of school desegregation and of black male suffrage by the 1870s. Um, so in order to take these matters of recovering women's labor and leadership on more thoroughly, we're going to move on now to a little later in time, um, the post-war and emancipation period, and a little bit further westward to Des Moines, which was at the time the still fairly new capital of the state of Iowa. So the organization of Burns Methodist Chapel by Black Methodists in Des Moines marked the beginning of a period of significant population growth and institution building in Des Moines. Um, initially incorporated as the Black Methodist Episcopal Church, Burns gained its namesake later, a few years later after founding from Francis Burns, who was the first Black missionary bishop in the white ME denomination. Um, so the church was organized just six years after the first census that recorded a black population count for Polk County. And that census recorded the presence of 13 black people in the county. So in many ways, the growth of the congregation in the coming decades paralleled the growth of the black community. Um, and the congregation had to fundraise and relocate multiple times between its founding in 1930 to accommodate this growing population. Um, by 1930, it secured a building on Crocker Street that would serve as its home for the remainder of the 20th century. So by the time of the 1868 Color Convention, it's becoming clear um, how the church equipped Black Iowans with the vocabulary and with a set of principles to pursue formal changes in law and legislation. But so too did uh, Black Iowans' wartime experiences. Um, 
when black men, including several AME pastors, convened at Burns in 1868, they substantiated their claims to suffrage and masculine terms. They cited their military service, um, crafting a masculine definition of patriotism, and then using this definition to compel white Iowans to ratify black male suffrage. We can see this especially um, in Alexander Clark's convention address quoted here, um, wherein he drew upon military service and uh, quoted from the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution to call for black male suffrage as a staple of a masculine tradition of rights that was supported by founding documents and traditions. Um, so when we read this address and consider that the delegation was entirely male and headed by Burns Reverend S. T. Wells, um, we can see the masculine dimensions of the relationship between church and convention movements in Iowa. However, um, so masculinity was core to the notions of citizenship uh, leveraged by conventioners. But by recognizing church and convention spaces as intertwined, um, we can pause here and ask where and how women made these activist spaces possible and how they might have shaped their agendas. It leads us to consider the spaces in between, um, the spaces that made the actual conventioning possible and where a broader community pursued and made real the demands leveraged by delegates in 1868. So when we look at these intersections, a few things become apparent. Um, Des Moines was becoming a key site for Black political strategizing and organizing by the late 1860s when the convention was held. Um, so itinerant ministers correspondence to the Christian Recorder, which was the denominational periodical, um, and other prominent leaders had for years frequented Des Moines to attend church conventions, meet with elected officials at the state house, and assess the prospects and the progress of church building at Burns, which again was incorporated under the ME, not AME denomination. Um, so AME Reverend J.W. Malone declared that the AME seed was unfurling and sowing in Des Moines and that the congregation at Burns was tired of being under the white folks. At the same time as um, denominational leaders and black activists in Iowa were, were recognizing the need to organize in Des Moines, they were also facing an onslaught of challenges at Burns. I apologize again, the photo is missing, but this is um, the photo that was there was um, a clipping of a newspaper recounting um, racist vandalism at Burns. We'll touch on that in a minute. Um, so white authored accounts scrutinized the financial conditions of the church throughout the 1860s and 70s. Um, the white daily state register chose to magnify the church's indebtedness and they called upon white congregations in Des Moines to come to the rescue of their wording um, to save the church. Um, the church was also the target of racist vandalism in 1869, the year after the convention. Um, so the contested independence and the racist attacks on Burns ME in the years preceding and following the 1868 convention reflected the insufficiency of state laws and the basic protections of citizenship to confer something closer to civic and social belonging for Black Iowans. It also reflected the distance between statewide electoral support for civil rights and white Iowans' local treatment of Black Iowans. So all of this shows how the masculinized rhetoric and the calls for formal rights delivered at the 1868 convention, in many ways, just barely touched the surface of the level of discrimination and injustice that Black Iowans were confronting on a day-to-day -day basis and challenging through multiple forms of activism. Okay, picture is back. Um, so out of all of this emerges a new church, um, St. Paul A&E in 1872. So the continuation of the church building movement with the capital city of Des Moines at its center by the 1870s um, reflects the extent to which Black Iowans political visions required multiple formal and informal, conventional and unconventional avenues to be realized. Um, church women were again central to the larger process of building a Black civic and political presence in Des Moines. Um, and the church was incorporated on October 9th on October 9th by 17 founders, which included several women. Um, in many ways, the process by which this church was founded and organized aligned with the precedents that were set by church building across the state since the 1840s. Um, Black women had labored throughout these decades as founders, Sunday school teachers, um, fundraisers, and society women. Um, what was different when it came to St. Paul, however, was the terms in which women's roles and contributions were understood. So in earlier decades of church building, women were most often construed in denominational histories and Afro-Protestant print culture as the helpmates of Black Methodist men. These standards shaped the content and the form of the print records that detail and document the earliest several decades of the church building movement. 
So this pattern um, continues initially when St. Paul um, is founded in 1872. But if we fast forward to two decades after St. Paul's founding, the emergence of a local Afro-Protestant print culture provided the impetus necessary to disrupt this pattern of erasure. Um, the founding of the Iowa State Bystander in part by St. Paul congregants in 1894 helped to initiate a departure from the omission of women from the denominational histories and other publications that told the history of church building in very masculine terms. Um, so the Bystander was organized by 10 lawyers, editors, and otherwise well-known Black men in 1894, uh, operating under the motto, Fear God, Tell the Truth, and Make Money. Um, the organization of the paper in 1894 changed the course of Iowa's Black parallel politics in two ways. First, it rendered church women's labor leadership visible, and second, it placed the church at the center of the newspaper's imagined community. So the church was deeply interwoven with African Methodist Episcopal um, life in Iowa. Um, founded in part by St. Paul member William Colson, um, the paper became Iowa's longest running Black newspaper. Um, as a layperson, a businessman, and a state employee central to the organization and the leadership of several other race work organizations, including the Iowa chapter of the Afro-American Protective Association, Colson exemplified the collective ethos and the multiple avenues that characterize um, Black Iowans' parallel politics. As an usher and a messenger to um, two Iowa governors, Frank Jackson and Francis Drake, Colson was purportedly the Black employee with the longest tenure working at the state capitol by 1897. His status as a layperson, as well as that of his wife, St. Paul organist and singer Mary Colson, um, shaped the objectives and the content of the newspaper. So with Colson at the helm, the bystander elevated a vision of race work to which the church was central. His repute as one of the best known Black men in the state and um, as a Christian gentleman and a race representative, these are all things that um, he was cast as in the newspaper. Um, these converged to form the basis of the politics espoused and the readership that was assembled by, this, by the paper's statewide circulation. So Colson is one example, but we can trace the relationships between the church and the newspaper deeper into St. Paul's lay community and the congregations across Iowa now. Um, so this imagined community composed of Black Methodist congregants and devoted to uplift and autonomy was not new or assembled solely through the uh, production of the newspaper. The paper instead functioned as glue for an existing infrastructure that had been created over nearly half a century by this point of statewide church building efforts. And then women shaped the contours of this imagined community, both as stewards and fundraisers and otherwise leaders in their churches and then as correspondence to the newspaper. So each bystander edition included the variety of local, state, and national stories on labor, politics, and culture, and a hefty collection of advertisements um, that was typical of the newspaper genre at the time. Um, the paper additionally included in each issue a full page or more of reportings straight from communities across the state. I've included some examples here um, under headers like Oscar Lusa Notes, Burlington Budget, and Sioux City News. The bystander would print the letters submitted by local correspondents um, regarding their community's affairs. So these letters um, flowed in from every corner of the state and assembled a large cast of characters and institutions constituting Black community life across the state. So this correspondence kind of provided a bridge between the geographic or the physical distance between Iowa's Black communities. Um, as correspondents wrote each week, they discussed the well-being, the travels, and the social affairs of lay people, and the content and the success of sermons, um, society meetings, and other congregational events. So through this local correspondence, the news of the church became the news of the community. So women appeared in the newspaper now as both actors and as narrators. Their roles in the church especially were documented, but they were also um, the ones sending in these letters every week. So as I just mentioned, the paper was headquartered in Des Moines, but um, covered news from across the state and the country to some degree, um, and was circulated and read by a similarly expansive readership. Um, so the paper's weekly editions relied upon this reporting from local correspondents. And although no women were included amongst the group of founders of the bystander, they served as the majority of the paper's local correspondence throughout the 1890s. So the 1899 column featured on this slide named 14 women amongst the paper's 19 total agents and correspondents. 
The women named in this column shared the status of being young, educated, and active church members. I've pulled the names from that 1899 column here. Um, these women came from every corner of the state. Um, Sunday School Superintendent May Davis wrote for Albia. Um, Play Society Secretary Josephine Proteau um, recorded the news from Sioux City, and Church Secretary Blanche Rober corresponded from Dubuque. Um, while many of the women among the correspondents, including Florence White of Muscatine and Blanche Rober, were high school students at the time of their writing the paper, several brought significant journalistic experience to bear. Um, so May Davis wrote previously for the Oskaloosa um, Negro Solicitor and for the Weekly Avalanche, um, both Black newspapers um, that were published before the Bystander. Um, Gay City correspondent Stady Benton wrote and delivered papers before Sunday school conventions. Um, and um, Cheriton correspondent Gertrude Irvin was already an active elocutionist across the state. Um, yeah. So these shared experiences were significant. Their proximity to the lay societies, to the Sunday schools, and the other um, networks of relationships um, in churches um, shaped the positionality that they brought to bear as correspondents to the newspaper. Um, if we zoom out now from these 14 women and consider the larger record that they contributed to each week, the significance of their shared experiences becomes even more um, apparent. So first, they were creating a record of church and community building that focused on relationships and the everyday interactions and labors that constituted lay life. Um, and in doing so, they were reconfiguring the individualistic and often patriarchal terms by which denominational life, history, and legacy um, had been narrated and understood. Um, so women correspondents instead narrated community news and history in relational terms. They communicated news in terms of relationships and networks. Um, and this was in many ways oppositional to the structures that dictated both AME and convention leadership. Um, and so in this reporting, they were revealing a more expansive view of the sites and the agendas and the strategies of a race work movement in which religious and political institution building and theorizing were in fact inseparable. Um, so if we consider what the bystander brought to nearly half a century of black parallel politics via church convention organizing, we see how the paper drew upon shared values and networks um, built by this institution building. So they read and subscribed to and authored contributions for the bystander. Um, black Iowans were knitting together decades of institution building across the state and forming um, something of a composite civic presence and culture in the state. So women's predominance as local correspondents meant they held a critical role in shaping the balance and the concerns of this imagined community. In applying the church's standards of decorum and sociability as parameters for who and what was to be acknowledged in the paper's columns, Women correspondents established a through line between the religious and the political consciousness fostered through the paper. And the bystander also enables us to locate an especially important actor in Iowa and really the upper Midwest regions, um, Black parallel politics. And that actor is um, author and AME churchwoman Catherine Tillman. So, um, Catherine Tillman was a writer since her high school days and a graduate of Wilberforce University in Ohio. Um, she began publishing her work by 1887, and um, these educational credentials, along with her status in the church as an active lay member and a society woman, and as wife to Reverend George Tillman, um, shaped her entry to the public debates and the larger readerships of the Black press. Um, so, if we look back at the bystander and um, its 14 women correspondents, um, many of those correspondents did not go on to become authors of the status or the wide acclaim of Tillman, but it's still important to read their lives and their writing careers together. We can see how um, Catherine Tillman's regular column in the paper by 1897 functioned as a reflection of the success of women correspondents since 1894 in carving out a public space and a forum for church women's concerns, labor, and leadership in Iowa. Um, so Tillman's work also engaged the collective and relational terms that bystander correspondents had for decades used or yeah, um, to narrate and interpret community news. Um, but the difference was that Catherine Tillman applied these terms to the past. Um, so Tillman's work was not bound by form or, or content. Um, she wrote as a columnist, an essayist, a poet, a playwright, and a novelist over the course of her lifetime. Um, but in applying these terms to the past, what I'm referencing is that um, Tillman contributed, contributed to the race history tradition. 
Um, by the 1880s, um, AME congregations across the country had begun to write, collect, and preserve um, denominational and race histories. Um, proponents of the practice in Iowa and elsewhere um, produced historical narratives to emphasize the respectability and the heroism of church founders and other predominantly um, male leaders. Um, Tillman's contributions to the race history tradition disrupted the singular and masculine terms set by these bodies of work. She wrote poetry and plays that memorialized slavery, emancipation, and freedom. Um, she narrated the everyday lives of African Americans in the wake of emancipation alongside the triumphs of AME preachers and Black soldiers. Her play, 20 Years of Freedom, attracted the praise of national Afro-Protestant press and as well as um, the praise of local Clinton audiences who assembled to watch its production at Bethel AME in 1899. So writing and directing these local productions of plays um, and its sequels, um, the 30 Years of Freedom and 50 Years of Freedom, alternatively titled um, From Cabin to Congress, Tillman was meshing religious and political, as well as local and national narratives of emancipation and freedom. So what is more that we can see here is that she was shaping the way that this work was interpreted as she directed and produced the plays at Keokuk and Clinton churches. Um, she also um, shaped the reception of her work by delivering essays and other work before these and other AME audiences across Iowa. Um, so it's helpful here to look at the specific content of um, Pullman's writing. So we see her strategies at work in this poem entitled Allen's Army. It's dedicated to Richard Allen, who founded Mother Bethel AME in Philadelphia, which began the denominational movement in 1794. Um, so in Tillman's poem, we can see how she's reframing church and national founding stories at once. She places Richard Allen on equal footing with the likes of Napoleon, Washington, and Grant. Um, and then at the same time as she's lionizing um, Richard Allen, she is also inscribing women's place in the church building movement with the gravity of history. So she names husbands, wives, and children too as members of Allen's army of African Methodists and um, she's re-narrating this history in relational and collective terms. Um, this pattern of resisting and interrupting the glorification of both white and male individuals is also quite clear throughout the rest of her body of work. Um, we can see it also in this poem is an homage to Ida B. Wells. Um, so this poem reflects Tillman's practice of what scholar um, Dr. Brittany Cooper has defined as the Black feminist tradition of listing. Um, by directly naming women and their accomplishments and contributions to race work, Tillman um, was substantiating a record of women's labor and authority and correcting its erasure in patriarchal institutional structures and historical narratives. Um, so we see here how Tillman used this practice to situate church women as central to not only the course of AME church building and to race work, but also to broader struggles for independence and freedom. Her engagement of citational politics of listing um, helps to explain women's labor and leadership not as a, um, like something of a surprise, but as illustrative instead of a lengthy and collective precedented tradition. Um, so she engaged her poetry toward these ends, but also we can see the citational politics of listing throughout her weekly column and club papers that she delivered, um, like noted women of Bible history, what they have done. Um, she used these papers to endow black women's leadership as race women with, again, the weight of history. So in her bystander column specifically, um, she lined these columns with the news of women's activities in church societies and women's clubs. Um, so here she's ennobling the work of club women like Frances Joseph, Mamie Fox, Mary Church Terrell, and other leaders of the Colored Women's Club movement, um, refuting not only the patriarchal notions of leadership that she sometimes encountered in the Black church, but also the racism of the burgeoning white women's club movement. Um, so in a 1900 column, Trudier Tillman is celebrating abolitionist orator Anna um, Douglas's address before a meeting of the National Mothers Council in the city of Des Moines. Um, and in the same column, she is reprimanding the white-led Federation of Women's Club's decision to exclude their only black delegate club woman and suffragist Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin from their Milwaukee meeting. Um, so by naming black women as anti-lynching agitators, as educational leaders, 
and other expressly public and political titles and by deeming them as entitled to the same protections and prerogatives claimed by white club women. Tillman was using in her column to dispel um, the dual forces of racism and sexism that attempted to constrain black women's place in the public sphere. We can see here too that she's using her column to advocate for the establishment of a paper devoted exclusively to the interests of women. Um, so she's using her um, platform in the bystander um, read by black communities across the state and beyond to uplift the particularities of black women's experiences and to frame these as appropriate guideposts um, or principles for race work. So read alongside the reportage of the bystanders uh, women correspondence Catherine Tillman's column and her broader literary career provide a lens into how Black women shaped the contours of Iowa's Black parallel politics throughout the 1890s. Um, women's deep institutional knowledge of the church capacitated the relationships between local congregations and the statewide newspaper that drew Black Iowans into an imagined community with shared solidarities. It produced the shifts from the individual male hero narratives of church and built a record of women's labor that presented their value and their importance to race work as historically precedented and necessary. So when we center these correspondence in Tillman's writing, uh, we can see clearly the extent to which church women's labor perspectives it afforded them shaped the agendas of Iowa's Black parallel politics by the turn of the century. Um, it's also helpful to read their actual bodies of work, um, Tillman and the correspondence, together because it reveals the dynamic interplay between the literary and expressive culture that shaped these parallel politics. The rich imagery and the heroism conjured up by Tillman's comparisons of Ida B. Wells um, to Joan of Arc and her staging of plays about emancipation point us toward the next, next section of today's presentation. So we'll return to St. Paul and look more closely at the relationship between that congregation and the bystander now. Um, like many of their predecessors across the state and the country, St. Paul church women were tasked with producing the fellowship and the funds necessary to secure the church's independence and to elevate its institutional reputability in the city, um, as well as in the AME denomination. Um, they interpreted their roles as stewardesses, deaconesses, and lay women as political prerogatives. So under the name of ice cream socials or literary meetings um, or musical performances, lay women were cultivating a rich expressive culture. Um, this culture included choral groups, a literary society, and um, many, many other groups of lay society. So um, St. Paul's network of associational life shared um, commitments to preserving and commemorating the church and the larger Black community's history. Um, so this expressive culture emerging out of um, St. Paul served two main ends. So first, it provided women with a vehicle for deliberating and articulating agendas that touched on issues of political and social equality ranging from suffrage to segregation. Um, second, this expressive culture provided um, church women with a means to frame their political activity as a continuation rather than as a departure or um, a challenge to masculinity. Um, in the history of the church. So in this way, we can read St. Paul church women's distinctive, expressive, and commemorative culture as one side of the continuous conversations between Black print culture and the expressive cultures fostered in the church. So St. Paul expressive culture occupied significant space in each edition of The Bystander. Black women's roles as curators and performers um, of this culture helped to mediate um, views of respectability politics within the church. You can see this kind of negotiation happening in the quote shared here. Um, so it says, if more of our white friends would come out to our colored churches and see the better class of our people, they would be greatly surprised at our rapid progress. So reporting like this in the bystander reinforced the careful negotiations that were conducted by women by reaffirming the church's role as a sort of arbitrator of community decorum and as um, an institution that could shroud the tensions that, and the disagreements that often surface in, organ in organizers' deliberation apart from the public view. And we can see why this kind of negotiation and the way that the bystander um, covered it um, was important when we look at this excerpt on the left um, from the White Daily Capital in 1892. 
Um, so ceremonies and rituals like Emancipation Day celebrations were under intense scrutiny. And this is one of the more positive reviews of such events in a white newspaper. Um, so with the bystander, we can see how the kind of uh, proliferation of expressive culture that happened in the 1890s at St. Paul and other, elsewhere um, was not due solely to the um, artistic prowess of the choirs or other performers themselves, but um, was crafted out of careful agreements and relationships between the church and the newspaper. Um, so the paper's reportage on events like song services and other fundraisers um, helps to reveal the ends to which lay people were using expressive culture. Um, the paper reported that song services took place on the first Sunday of each month. They reiterated that these services were open to the public, and they also frequently reported upon who attended, um, the quality of the performance, and other details. Um, so with this reporting, um, bystander correspondents were making sure to stage the church's respectability politics as evidence of Black political agency and civic belonging in the state writ large. So by curating and staging Black commemorative culture before interracial and oftentimes predominantly white audiences, St. Paul's church women were delineating the bounds of respectability politics, while also establishing um, the public nature of their roles as arbitrators of th these politics. Um, so they used two main strategies or mechanisms to this end. So first there was a programmatic element and second a fundraising element. So if we start with the programming, um, song service and other events um, were, um, their program agendas were filled with musical and literary selections that um, preserved the distinctiveness of AME traditions um, and of specific local um, Black histories, while also translating select dimensions of these traditions, these histories, into targeted and often um, political messages for attendees. Um, so they included hymns of the white Protestant tradition alongside sermons and musical selections that were composed and delivered by Black pastors and musicians. Um, this combination of programming helps these programs to serve as artistic stagings of Black parallel politics that navigated um, between institutional belonging and community autonomy in the state and um, civic equality, civic and social equality um, for it within a predominantly white setting. Um, so performances rendered at lay society meetings and public occasions like anniversary celebrations and picnics um, interspersed musical varieties with the lectures on um, the condition and the success of Iowa's Black communities and AME congregations elsewhere. So, um, for example, an old settlers picnic organized by St. Paul congregants in 1899 featured singing by the Children's Glee Club um, alongside an address by St. Paul Reverend um, Timothy Reeves and remarks from um, the white Iowa Secretary of State, G.L. Dobbs. Um, another example, St. Paul's 26th anniversary celebration included multiple choral performances and historical addresses on the history of the church and its choirs um, that were read by St. Paul's church mother, um, Amy Allen. And then if we turn to the second, um, strategy that church women used in this expressive culture. Um, the financial imperatives that were attached to um, choral and other performances provided church women with another opportunity to advance parallel politics um, in the mainstream and autonomy in the church. Um, so church women commissioned choristers' talents for fundraising and uplift work, raising money for local mutual aid, as well as organizations like the Freedman Aid Society and Wilberforce College, um, Catherine Tillman, Alma mater and also the country's oldest private historically black university in Wilberforce, Ohio. Um, the audiences who attended public choral performances, which were again, usually termed song services, um, were usually interracial and sometimes predominantly white. So a February 16th, 1900 song service review published in the Bystander and featured here um, noted that three quarters of the audience was white. Um, among this assemblage um, was Iowa's governor, as well as several state senators and city officials, all of which would have been white. Um, so by charging admission fees and um, then having the programmatic elements of drawing through lines between cultural and civic expression, church women were enlisting these interracial audiences and witnesses um, as compatriots um, in intervening in a predominantly white civic sphere and in um, making space for Des Moines uh, burgeoning black civic sphere and um, 
making their case for equality and belonging in the state. So um, again, drawing parallels back to Catherine Tillman, um, St. Paul church women engaged the tools of history and specifically of remembering and commemorating certain histories to launch intervention into Iowa's dominant civic culture. And this is also where the newspaper, The Bystander, was key. Um, the Bystander's regular coverage of St. Paul's expressive culture helped bring into the public consciousness the connections that church women had long forged between literacy, history, history and civic belonging. Um, the newspaper presented St. Paul women's stagings of longstanding traditions like Emancipation Day celebrations as strategic interventions into Iowa's dominant political culture. So in the wake of the Civil War, Emancipation Day celebrations had emerged across Iowa as the primary cultural form um, for um, enacting citizenship it existed beyond the ballot box, um, beyond voting. So these, were, these celebrations were not due by the 1890s, but in acting as primary orchestrators of these events in the 1890s, St. Paul church women were straddling the challenge of shaping experiences and the interpretation of both the audiences who assembled to partake or to watch the events and of the readers who would encounter the events through the pages of the bystander, but also in the pages of local white newspapers. Um, so in organizing these celebrations, St. Paul women were weighing the meanings of slavery and emancipation for, Iowa, and emancipation for Iowans. Um, they were wielding control over the public narratives that emerged through recurrent celebratory and commemorative exercises. They performed roles that um, coupled femininity with patriotism, and they um, used these roles to intervene in traditional narratives. Um, so they were foregrounding their own contributions, their experiences, like in this clipping, um, in these two clippings we see here from celebrations. Um, so we see here how Black women like Beatrice Hickman in 1897 um, were crafting their images as active agents in local, local as well as national um, Black freedom struggles. And what is more, they were, um, like Catherine Tillman, positioning these struggles um, in the church um, in Iowa as extricable from the nation's history and the nation's founding narratives. So then when we turn back to the bystanders, bystanders narration of the visuals and the characters put together by these women helped to render their performances and their interventions into a broader public consciousness. Um, so by curating rituals of performance and remembrance alongside visual culture, um, women organizers were staging interventions in both the commemorative tradition of American history that were dominated by white Iowans memories and allegiances and um, those masculinized race histories. Um, so there was a direct relationship being forged here between memory and politics. Um, church women's efforts to reframe dominant landscapes of civil war and emancipation memory was meant to be instructive for the race work organizations in the direction that they were taking um, and formulating in and outside of the church by the turn of the century. So we'll now take a look at some of the institutions that really exemplified the fusion of institutional citizenship and public memory that were stewarded by church women in Des Moines um, in the 1890s. So I'm going to again use St. Paul and this time um, the Paul Dunbar Literary Society or the PDLS um, that was led by St. Paul congregants as kind of a microcosm into this fusion. Um, so the PDLS adopted its constitution and its bylaws and it elected its first slate of officers in 1897. Um, the structure of the organization and its activities um, modeled the connections that church women had drawn for decades between literacy and citizenship. Um, Black women held five of the society's eight officer roles upon founding um, that used these positions to advance the interventions that they had begun to make through um, this combined fusion of expressive and print culture. Um, so the PDLS is focused on reading, debate, and elocution or reading papers being um, enabled women to practice forms of self-representation in um, a political sense more explicitly. So as they occupied the ranks of PDLS leadership and membership, um, church women focused the society's agenda squarely on addressing the oppressive conditions and the insubstantial citizenship afforded to Black communities in Iowa and elsewhere in the nation. Um, so using debate, music, um, sometimes question box exercises, they would address matters ranging from 
colonization to lynching in the South. Um, and women use these exercises to expand their interpretations of the challenges experienced by local communities with which they were familiar um, to encompass Black communities across the country. Um, they requisitioned local, state, and federal authorities to further their cause. Um, deliberating these matters through formal debate, um, which was a practice that was typically reserved for men, and through carefully curated musical performances, um, the Literary Society women enacted a form of citizenship that was grounded in collective literary practices. So we can contextualize the um, Paul Dunbar Literary Society um, in Des Moines, both in the broader slate of literary societies that organized in the country since the early 1820s, and in the flurry of society, club, and other race work organizing that was taking place in Iowa by the turn of the century. Um, so first, um, literary societies were not um, a new phenomenon by the time of the Paul Dunbar Literary Society's organization. Um, these emerged first in free Black communities across the North as avenues for self-improvement and racial uplift in the early 1820s and came to adopt increasingly political inclinations in the wake of emancipation Reconstruction. We can see how the PDLS fits this pattern. Um, and literary societies um, throughout these decades uh, had engaged in the same collective practices of authorship, circulation, um, and deliberation of texts. Um, for PDLS members, these practices serve multiple ends. So, with church women at the helm, um, the PDLS continued the practices of cataloging and commemorating um, race histories that were um, begun through St. Paul's consistent installments of choir performances, community meals, and other historically minded um, programming. So um, centering their literary engagements around works by Black authors and artists, um, the PDLS worked to translate their programming into political intervention. But then the second contextualization that we can do is in placing the PDLS within Iowa's landscape of race work organizing. So the PDLS represented one of the multitude of organizations to which church women relocated and um, kind of remade the roles that they had first occupied as stewardesses, as deaconesses, and other leaders of gender segregated lay societies. Um, there are many organizations to which we could trace church women's influence. Um, the local chapters of the Afro-American Protective Association and the NAACP emerged in um, subsequent decades in the early 20th century. Um, but I think it's especially useful here to look more directly at the organizations that women shepherded into being and led. So if the convergence of the AME church building and convention movement kind of commenced Iowa's Black parallel politics, and we can read the emergence of literary societies and women's clubs that were founded and led by church women as a sort of new page or stage in the development of these politics at the end of the century. Um, so the emergence of these organizations across the state represented um, kind of an institutionalization of the collective literacy practices that women had honed for years through associational life and through the Afro-Protestant press um, and through the bystander. Um, so Dr. Denise Rule has shown how the Colored Women's Club movement found purchase in Iowa from the strength of religious institutional life in the state. Um, Iowa clubs drew significant proportions of their memberships from the church and society leaders and reverends wives were uh, prominent amongst the rank of club leadership. Um, in Des Moines, St. Paul Church women, including uh, Isabel Graves, who was the wife of Reverend Horace Graves and um, singer Georgia Holt, um, were leaders of the Harriet Beecher Stowe Reading Circle. Um, so other clubs included the Francis Allen Harper Club, um, the Ida B. Wells Reading Club, and the Francis C. Williams Club. So we can see in these names alone the continuation of traditions begun by predecessors like Catherine Hillman. Um, they're also engaging this practice of listing that she used, um, situating themselves as inheritors of a race work tradition that had long been stewarded by Black women. So much like the PDLS in Des Moines, the organization of women's clubs across the state reflected church women's um, capacity to refashion identities and objectives first espoused in the church and really carved down that space into vehicles for suffrage, for desegregation, for other kinds of overt political change. Um, so the centralization of the club movement in Iowa by the turn of the century contributed more broadly to a crystallization of the organizational infrastructure and the agenda of Iowa's Black parallel politics. 
we can now see how this movement expanded outwards from black churches and newspapers to encompass this broader array of literary societies, of women's clubs, of fraternal organizations, um, and again, of local chapters of national organizations. So a more accurate depiction in this timeline would really be like a web that shows the number of different organizations and their overlapping memberships and agendas um, that ultimately stemmed out of this early church building convention foundation and that accelerated and consolidated with the emergence of the bystander in 1894. Um, but regardless, we can read the continuation and the growth of organizations founded and led by the turn of the century as both a reflection of the extent to which church women's labor and leadership molded and kept these politics alive and powerful. We can also see in their prevalence the extent to which women remained sidelined and marginalized by the dual forces of patriarchy and white supremacy that were encompassed in respectability politics. So while the respectability politics may have over time operated as an avenue through which women found and created new venues for their civic and political leadership, we also have to account for the ways that they constrained the scope and the concerns of Iowa's Black parallel politics. However, when we're able to look at this broad array of church, print culture, um, this ecosystem of political organizing, we can recover a more expansive definition of activism and then turn to rich records of women's activists, uh, women activists' um, visions and strategies that enables us to imagine um, a broader scope of their activism and their influence um, from the 19th century all the way through today. So thank you. Thank you, Mila. Uh, we have time for just about two questions here. Um, and our first one is a two-parter to start off with. Um, what archives were the most beneficial to your research? And then do the AME churches have their own archives? Um, yeah, thank you for that question. So the most useful place, like starting point for my research, I think was actually just digital um, records of newspapers. So um, the Iowa State bystander records um, are actually searchable. Like, I don't think they're blocked be behind institutional access. Um, you can search them on the Library of Congress. Um, and those are just like the richest record of um, church institutional life, um, as well as Black parallel politics more generally. Um, but then, so those were kind of my starting point. And also I would say that um, the Christian Recorder actually has um, quite a rich record of the kind of organizing happening um, within the state of Iowa um, and kind of like is useful for tracing connections between the activism happening in Iowa and across the country more broadly. Um, I would also, yeah, I have to shout out that um, Color Conventions Project has um, like records of the conventions um, the records that exist and are digitized, they're all available on their website. Um, and um, the Iowa Color Conventions Project here, which I'm a part of, is working to um, locate and digitize and make publicly accessible more of those records. Um, so that's also really valuable. Um, I think there is an official um, AME church archive. Um, I believe it is in, it is housed at Bethel AME, last I checked in um, Philadelphia. Um, for this project, I actually visited um, the archives at Wilberforce College um, Pain Seminary, um, and that's where I found a lot of really interesting materials about Catherine Tillman. Um, I think all of her plays, the like 20 Years of Freedom um, and its sequels, they're all located there. Um, and there are also some of the race histories I mentioned um, at that archive. Um, but in terms of AME archives more broadly, I think that. Um, there is like that national one, but you'll find a lot more um, at just like local, um, at the local archives, depending on what um, specific church or what region you're looking at. Thank you. I will also add that the Colored Conventions Projects digital records will be included in our follow-up email for our participants today. Um, and our last question today is, where can we find your research? Um, yeah, so I am currently working on turning this research into an article for the Annals of Iowa. So um, that is in the works um, under review and revision. Um, so hopefully um, within the next couple of years that will be out. Um, so the other thing that I'd mention is um, as a member of the Iowa Color Conventions Project, um, we are finishing up an exhibit on the 1857 convention and hopefully that will be accessible to all soon. Um, and we also try to um, 
just like we're trying to build a, a broader base of archival and um, like interpretive materials. So um, yeah, I would say keep an eye out for that in the next year too. Um, yeah, other than that, um, I am a PhDC right now. So hopefully I will have an article out um, of some other variety in the coming year. Um, but those are the main things. Thank you for asking. Of course, that's fantastic. We'll, we'll keep our eye out for it. Uh, and with that answer, we will bring this webinar to a close. Uh, thank you to everyone joining us today. And I would like to extend one last thank you to our presenter, Mila, today. Thank you so much. We hope everyone will sign up for the Iowa History 101 webinars that take place on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. There are many great stories from Iowa's past to tell in the upcoming months. Now, for more information and to register for future webinars in this series, please check out our website at iowaculture.gov. This webinar and past presentations are available on our website as well. And, and while you're there, you can look into some other fantastic digital programs we have, such as our Goldie's Kids Club programs for young historians, or watch video recordings of the Iowa Story series, which is hosted by our Iowa City branch. We look forward to virtually seeing you all here, right here again on Thursday, July 28th. Thank you all again for joining us today and have a great afternoon. Thanks everyone.